We're continuing our study this morning through the Sermon on the Mount. If you will, take your copy of God's Word, turn to Matthew. First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. Things bought at a garage sale, garage sale usually do not end up on the evening news, right? But in 2007, there was a bowl bought by a New York family. Uh, it was a Chinese bowl. And it became famous in April of 2013. The new owners paid just $3 for what turned out to be a precious, priceless bowl from the Northern Song Dynasty. It was more than 1,000 years old. Until someone told them what they really had, the family just stuck the bowl over the mantel of the fireplace, over their fireplace. When they placed the bowl with Sotheby's auction house for sale, it was estimated to go for approximately $200,000. Instead, a dealer from London purchased it for more than $2 million. Why would the first owners sell something for so valuable for only $3? The answer is that they did not appreciate, nor did they know what it was worth. And we may shake our heads at that truth, but the fact is, every day, we as followers of Christ give up something far more valuable than money could buy for something that is ultimately worthless. Likewise, prayer is an amazing, priceless, and precious gift from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet, we tend to treat prayer like a $3 bowl consigned to a rummage sale. How do we do this, you may ask? Well, we do this when we fail to make prayer the priority that it was meant to be. I agree with Warren Wearsby, the time has come for the church to get its priorities in order. And one of the best ways to do this is to find out what was important to Jesus. Matthew 6, 9 through 15, our text this morning in the parallel passage, which is Luke 11, 1 through 4, clearly revealed that prayer was a priority to Jesus. Furthermore, we learn from this, these two passages on prayer that not only was prayer meant to be, was a priority for Jesus, it was also meant to be a priority for his followers as well, which includes us. If you would stand with me in the reading of God's word this morning, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse number 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of your word. Now, God, help us this morning with a prayer that perhaps many of us have repeated. Certainly, we have heard. In other words, we are very familiar, many of us. But, Lord, help us even in the midst of hearing something that perhaps many of us are familiar with. Lord, to listen and to hear your word as if we are hearing it for the very first time. Open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears to be receptive to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Matthew 6, 9 through 15, Jesus gives his followers a model for prayer. The body of the prayer you'll see this morning really falls into two major sections. The first part contains three petitions concerning the glory of God. I find it very interesting that Jesus in this model prayer started with an address, uh, how we address him, but also that our focus in this prayer begins with him. 
Second part of this prayer contains three more petitions concerned with the personal needs of Jesus' disciples. So let's begin with the first section and the first three petitions. We're going to learn this morning that we ought to pray in terms of God's glory. Pray in terms of God's glory. There in verse 9, we see this language, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. As it's already been mentioned in verses 9 through 13, Jesus is giving his followers a pattern, a paradigm, a model for prayer. It's often called the Lord's Prayer. It's pro- it would probably be even better worded or named if it was called the Disciples Prayer. I really believe the Lord's Prayer is in John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. We actually Here, Jesus praying to his heavenly Father. Here, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples how to pray. So he's giving them a pattern or a paradigm or a model for prayer. There are two quick thoughts about this before we get back into the outline. This model, we, if you remember the context, we really studied this last Sunday. This model that Jesus is going to give is contrasted with two types of prayer that Jesus mentioned in verses 5 through 8. Boasting prayer, go back to verse 5 and you can see, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, say to you they have received their reward. So Jesus is going to take this model prayer in verses 9 through 13. He's contrasting it with what he's already talked about. Don't pray like this. Don't pray boasting prayers, but also also Jesus is going to talk about in verses 7 through 8, thoughtless prayers. Jesus is saying, don't pray like this. Verse 7 and 8, he says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Then he says, pray like this. So it's interesting to see Jesus begins with saying, don't pray prayers, boasting prayers or thoughtless prayers. But then you get down to verse 9 and Jesus says, instead, pray like this. Something else that catches your attention is the brevity of the prayer. The shortness of it, 57 words in the original Greek language, and it can be repeated in 20 seconds or less. Again, this is only a model. Jesus said, pray then like this. Did you notice that language? He didn't say, pray this exactly. Therefore, this prayer was offered by Jesus as a model rather than a mantra to be recited. Now, there's nothing wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer. I know many churches do that. I've done it in my life on on numerous occasions. There's nothing sinful in and of that. But the idea here is that this would be a model prayer, not that you would necessarily repeat this specific prayer. It also fits the prayer culture of the first century. Jewish rabbis would often teach the people outline prayers or index prayers. The rabbis would gather together a number of short sentences, each of which suggested an item for prayer. And they would recite one sentence, and then before proceeding with the next sentence, they would enlarge upon it. They would draw out some of its implications and some of its applications. So when Christ's disciples, if you go to Luke chapter 11 and the parallel passage to Matthew chapter 6, there in Luke 11, the disciples asked Jesus, say, teach us to pray. They saw something different and passionate and powerful in the life of Jesus in intimacy and prayer with the Heavenly Father, and they desired that. So when Christ's disciples sought instruction in prayer, Jesus gave them Matthew 6, 9 through 15, he gave them an index prayer. Now notice this prayer begins with the phrase, Our Father in heaven. It's easy to look over it, but don't miss the word our. In fact, you see collective language throughout the Lord's prayer. This prayer is for the gathered community, not private prayer. Certainly the Lord's prayer can be prayed privately, but it's meant to be prayed in community. Private prayer is biblical. However, this prayer is an example of a prayer meant to be prayed in fellowship with other believers, not in isolation. And I just want to encourage you, I think this is a great place to be reminded that 
if you're a follower of Christ, specifically if you're a member of Campbellsville Baptist Church, don't isolate yourself from your faith family. That means participating in weekly worship gatherings like this, unless you're providentially hindered. It means participating in a small group, a Sunday school class, where you can love on others, serve and be served. It's a good reminder that we need to pray with and for our brothers and sisters often. But don't miss this. We are, we are a collective family, but we have one Father. Did you see that? Our Father in heaven. We address Him intimately as Father, but don't miss His infinite greatness with the addition of in heaven. Our Father in heaven. And so here in a portion of one verse, we see the transcendence of God, but yet we also see the imminence of God. We see that He is other than he is a transcendent, holy God that is other than us. We see that kind of language that he is in heaven. But we also realize that he is our father. And so there's a perfect balance between the imminence of God, the nearness of God, and this idea of the transcendence of God, that he is other than us. There's a beautiful balance of this in Scripture. It's always wise to begin our times of prayer remembering who he is specifically here we see that he is our father in heaven but he's also our creator he's our sustainer he's our savior he's our shepherd and the list could go on and on and on so taking time to orient ourselves towards God and who he who he is radically affects us in two ways first God's concern will be given priority. Notice your name, your kingdom, and your will be done. We're about to study each one of those petitions. But when we begin to orient ourselves towards God in a Godward way, God's concerns will be given priority. Not only in our prayer time, but all throughout life, in our day-to-day -day concerns. And second, we're going to see that our own needs though in second place, will be totally committed to Him. We're going to see that in the second half of the Lord's Prayer. And here's something really powerful that I don't want you to miss. We are by nature children of wrath. We are at enmity with God. We're talking about before a person repents of their sins and turns to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Before they're born again, the Bible's very clear that we are by nature children of wrath. In other words, we are not universally children of the Father. And the only way that you and I ever have the right to call God Father in His presence is because we have been purchased, we have been bought, we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and we have been adopted as children of God. That's a good place for an amen. amen. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we can't call him Father because he's not our Father until we have been redeemed, until we have been adopted as children of God. Only in Christ do you become a member of the household of God. And so the question this morning before we go any further in this prayer is this, are you in Christ? Are you a follower of his? Do you belong to him? Have you been born again? Have you been redeemed and purchased by the blood of the Lamb? If so, then you are a child of God. You have been adopted into His family. You're a son or a daughter of the King. But if not, then you're still a child of wrath. If you're not in Christ, I just want to encourage you, trust Him for salvation today. And following the initial address here, our Father in heaven, Jesus is going to discuss three petitions concerning the glory of God. Here's the first petition. Pray for His name to be revered, honored, glorified. Look at verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. God's name in the Bible regularly means the person that He has revealed Himself to be. And in ancient times, names were special. In other words, your name was part and parcel of who you were. Remember in Genesis, God gave Adam a name. 
And from that, God gave Adam the authority to name the animals. And that signified that God had dominion and authority over Adam and, by extension, over all the, all the animals. But also that Adam had dominion and authority over the animals. In other words, the one who gives names has authority. Hallowed means known or acknowledged. Honored is holy, revered. And so the idea here is this. When we pray, we esteem, honor, treasure God's name and person above all else. Hallowed be your name. And so this prayer, this petition teaches us first and foremost to prioritize God in our praying. In a very real sense, the first petition that we just studied sets the tone for the remaining petitions in the Lord's Prayer. John Piper adds this, Nothing is more clear to me than the purpose of the universe is for hallowing of God's name. His kingdom comes for that. His will is done for that. Humans have, have bread sustained life for that. Sins are forgiven for that. And temptation is escaped for that. It all begins with, hallowed be your name. Everything else, all the other petitions in the Lord's prayer flow from that first petition. Now, I want you to think about something. We don't have a lot of time to think about this, but I want you to stop just for a moment and consider that hallowing God's name is a commitment that has any time, anywhere implications. Hallowing God's name is a commitment that has any time, anywhere implications. For example, hallowed be your name when one week we're dealing with tornadoes and the next week we're dealing with six to eight inches of snow. And as a result, it just seems like you just fall further and further behind in work or whatever you're trying to do. Hallowed be your name when tornadoes hit our community, not once, but twice in less than a month. It's easy for us to say, glory to your name when it seems like everything's going great in our lives but we're called to hallow his name no matter the circumstances hallowed be your name when we go to the doctor and we receive bad news about our health you see hallowing god's name has anywhere anytime implications so pray for his name to be revered secondly second petition pray for his kingdom to come verse 10 he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Believers of the Lord Jesus Christ are called to pray and work for the continual of advancement of God's kingdom here on earth. Now, true enough, God's kingdom will come whether we advance it or not. All right? It's not depend God's kingdom is not dependent upon me or you. Praise God for that. Therefore, if we pray, your kingdom come to the Lord, we are not giving God an okay for him to perform his sovereign work. He's going to perform his sovereign work whether we're on board or not. But what a blessing to us when we are on board with God's sovereign work. The kingdom of God is his rule. When we pray, your kingdom come, we are in part longing for that final establishment of God's rule over all of his creation. And if you think about it, the kingdom of God is a coming event and it's a present reality. Just consider that you and I have the privilege of participating in God's kingdom. We have the privilege of participating in what God is doing. And one of the greatest examples that I can think of, earthly example, of participation is seeing a classroom of children after the teacher has asked a question. The children immediately and eagerly do what? Raise their hands. Why? Because they want to be involved. They desire to participate. Think about if we had the same eagerness and expectation and passion to be involved in God's kingdom work as those children do in participating in their classroom. Everywhere you go, church has kingdom implications. Everywhere. Let me give you a quick example. You're going to the local restaurant after church. You, your desire is to get in, get out, maybe tip the waiter or waitress and get home, right? 
Well, let me, let me invite you to pray before you go to the restaurant this afternoon after church. Pray your kingdom come. The greeter, the waitress, the people waiting for a table around you, they could be totally open to kingdom conversations. But a lot of times we're just trying to blow in and blow out and not be seen or whatever the case may be. If we would just stop and say, Lord, may your kingdom come. It has anywhere, anytime implications. Kingdom imp impl impl implications during the morning commute with your family. Think about it as you're taking your children to school or your grandchildren are picking them up at work or school or the team or the dance squad. Everywhere you go and everything you do has the potential for kingdom implications. And so we pray, Lord, may your kingdom come. But then notice, thirdly, we pray for his will to be done. And I really believe the phrase that's attached to pray for his will to be done there in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe all three of these petitions are connected to that last phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. Hallowed be your name or your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And your will to be done, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what do, we say, what do we see here in this third petition? Jesus is teaching believers to pray for the perfect accomplishment of God's will on earth just as it is in heaven. And if you think about it, this petition is closely related to the second petition. We pray for God's universal rule and reign to come personally in his kingdom, which naturally leads us to pray for his will to be done. By the way, did we ever see Jesus praying like this? Absolutely. Think about before Jesus' crucifixion, Luke twenty two forty two. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, what? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless... Not my will, but your will be done. Can I just submit to you this morning, thy will be done is not a prayer of convenience. In fact, thy will be done is a dangerous prayer. There is a cost that accompanies this petition. Praying your will to be done demands this that your own needs and your own emotions take a back seat to God's desire for your life. In other words, it's saying when I pray, I want God's will to be done in my life, in my community, in my nation, ultimately in my world. Now I want you to picture this with me. Let me try to illustrate. It's springtime and the weather is starting to warm up. Can I get an amen? Doesn't that sound good already? We were kind of spoiled during the month of De November and December, weren't we? It's the middle of the work, work week and it's around 2 p.m. or so. And I begin to think as soon as I leave the church office around 5 p.m., I'm going to go home, I'm going to change clothes, and I'm going to hit the golf course. For all you golfers out there, can I get an amen? Doesn't that sound good? I can already feel the club in my hand, and I can see that little white ball traveling into the horizon straight down the middle of the fairway. All right, it's my dream, okay? <laughs> but suppose I get home after work, and as I'm putting on my comfortable clothes, I learned that my wife or my children have had a difficult day and they need to talk. Then I receive a text or a phone call from a church member that's having an emergency situation and they need, they need their pastor as soon as possible. <laughs> and those kind of situations, whose kingdom is going to win? Whose needs are going to be met? Whose will is going to prevail? Therefore, the right question to ask and pray at 2 p.m. is not, wonder if I could get to the golf course by 5.30, but Lord, will you keep me open to your will? The idea is, Lord, I am open to your will being done no matter what, whatever may come this evening. You see the difference in that kind of praying? We pray 
in terms of God's glory. But I want you to notice, secondly, we pray in terms of our good. There's a second section. A lot of times we begin there in our prayer life, don't we? We begin with praying in terms of our good, and we may get to praying in terms of God's glory. But when the Lord gave this model prayer to his disciples, he reversed that. He prayed, he taught us to pray in terms of his glory first, and then we pray in terms of our good. Now look at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The last three petitions of the Lord's Prayer focus on the personal needs of man. One pastor said this, I love this quote. We move now to the moment where we crawl up into our Father's lap and we bring before Him our daily needs. Do you notice, some people say, so that means... You start with praying in terms of God's glory, and that's where you, that's it, right? No. Jesus is teaching us that's where we begin, but then there's the opportunity for us to crawl up into his lap as our Heavenly Father and bring our needs before him. This is not to say that we do not bring our needs before the Lord. We just need to get the order straight. Because it totally changes our mindset when we begin with God first and not us first. We begin with Him and then we are ready and prepared to ask appropriately before the Lord about our needs. So number one, we see or the fourth petition. Pray for God to meet your daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a powerful petition. Only seven words in English. Notice some things about it. First, notice the substance of the prayer is bread. And in the Bible, bread not only represents food, but it's also symbolic of all of our physical needs. All of our physical needs. The source of the prayer is Father God. Remember, it's the Father who is addressed throughout this this prayer. Our Father in heaven. The source of the prayer is is. Father God, but the supplication of the prayer is expressed in the word give. Give us this day our daily bread. This is the heart of the petition because it recognizes there's a need. The seeker of the prayer is the us of Jesus' prayer. Are those who truly belong to him. And then don't miss this. This is easy to lose and miss. The schedule of the prayer The schedule of God's provision for his children. Did you see that little word there, daily? Give us our daily bread. This means, church, that we rely upon the Lord one day at a time. Bread was a powerful symbol in the Old Testament of God's provision for his people. During the wilderness wanderings, the children of Israel received from God rained bread from heaven. And the next morning, remember the story, when the dew lifted, there remained behind on the ground of manna. And God gave them enough bread for what? A day's supply. And any extra spoiled the second day. So do you realize that the children of Israel were always just one day away from running out of food, yet God provided daily for the children of Israel. I think the psalmist picked up on this in Psalm 38 and 9. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and still and so dishonor the name of my God. Pray for God to meet your daily needs. Secondly, pray for God to forgive you and to forgive your spiritual debts. Forgive us our debts, verse 12, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now think about this. The Bible presents sin from a lot of different angles. We see sin as law-breaking, deviation. We see, we see sin as shortcoming or rebellion or pollution sense of dirtiness we also see sin in the sense of missing the target but the lord's prayer takes a different angle and views sin as that of unpaid debts 
Therefore, think about it. A prayer for forgiveness is a plea for God to cancel the debt of our sin. It's very powerful. And Jesus adds there, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then in verses 14 and 15, he's going to explain that even further. Drop down to verse 14 and 15. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus is reemphasizing the importance of believers forgiving others. Now I want you to notice, therefore, there's a direct correlation between having been forgiven by God and forgiveness that we as his disciples must be willing to extend to others by necessity. When you begin to practice a lifestyle of forgiveness, three things will happen. First, there will be personal emancipation. In other words, you will be set free. Anybody in here just drowning in, the, in, the, in unforgiveness? When you begin to practice a lifestyle of forgiving others, you will be personally emancipated. Secondly, there will be personal reconciliation. Not only does it set you free, but it reconciles you forgiving others with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to gain or regain your brother or your sister. And then thirdly, we see emancipation and reconciliation. We see spiritual jubilation, excitement. There's going to be revival. Someone once said real revival is not getting the roof off and getting right with God only but getting the walls down and getting right with one another. Revival has vertical, has a vertical dimension with our Heavenly Father, but revival also has a horizontal dimension with brothers and sisters in Christ. So we pray for God to forgive us as we have forgiven others. And then the sixth petition, pray to God to deliver you from Satan. Look at the text, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, it's important to know when you look at the whole counsel of God's word that God does not tempt. God never tempts. He tests, but God never tempts. Satan is the one who tempts. What's the difference? Some of you may be asking. God tests us in order to prove us and to bring us to spiritual maturity. Let me give you an example. Genesis chapter 22. God puts Abraham's faith to the test regarding the sacrifice of his son Isaac, right? God is not tempting Abraham. God is testing Abraham. The, the outcome was for Abraham's good and ultimately for God's glory. Now, temptation is not that way. Think about Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan. Satan, Satan tempted Jesus to bring about his downfall. He was, he was not trying to grow Jesus spiritually, right? Satan tempted Jesus to destroy him, to bring about his downfall. So do you see the difference between testing and tempting? But the prayer petition that we see here in Matthew 6, 13 is, don't let us give in or succumb to temptation, but instead rescue, deliver us from evil. Or some of your translations may say the evil one. Now listen, you can deal with temptation in one of three ways. Number one, you can give in to temptation. We've probably all done that, right? And the result of that is shame and regret. Been there, done that. Secondly, you can fight temptation with your own strength. That may last for a while, but guess what? You're going to eventually succumb to temptation. You're going to fail. Thirdly, you can fight temptation covered by the Lord's armor and wielding the sword of the Spirit. 
Ephesians chapter 6. This is the method that Jesus used when he was tempted by Satan himself. He wielded the word of God. So are you giving in to Satan's temptations? The great preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, What setting sins or what setting are you in when you fail? He said, avoid them. What props do you have that support your sin? Eliminate them. What people are you usually with? Avoid them. There are two equally condemning lies Satan wants us to believe. Number one, just once won't hurt. And number two, now that you've ruined your life, you are beyond God's use and you might as well enjoy sinning. Those are two lies straight from Satan himself. Pray for God to deliver you from the evil one. As we close this morning, I'm reminded of the movie War Room. How many of y'all have, have seen that movie? A bunch of you have. If you've, if you've never seen the movie War Room, let me encourage you. You need to get a copy of it, stream it, whatever you need to do. You need to watch that movie. It's powerful. There's one scene in the movie that where Miss Clara asks a question that I would like to pose to you this morning as we close. She said, so if I asked you what your prayer life was like, would you say that it was hot or cold? If you're one of probably few in this room that would say, Pastor, my prayer life is hot. Praise God. Praise God. Be sure to thank Him for that. Don't take it for granted. Let me encourage you, if your prayer life is, is hot, teach others. Take time to disciple others about the importance of prayer. If you're one of the many here this morning that would probably say, Pastor, my prayer life is cold. I have one encouraging word and I have one challenge. Here's the encouraging word. God's love for you does not depend upon your performance for Him. Let me say that again. God's love for you does not depend upon your performance for Him. So in other words, the idea that maybe some of us have at times in life is if my prayer life is really good, my Bible reading is really sharp, and I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with people, I'm having gospel conversations, and I'm living for Jesus, then Jesus loves me more. But when I don't do those things, or when I struggle with those things, then Jesus loves me less. When the Bible's very clear that your, your, God's love for you and me is not dependent upon your performance or my performance for Him. And praise God for that. It's not dependent upon us. God does not respond to your lack of praying with less love. He gives grace. Amen? He gives grace. We, we totally reduce Christianity to do's and don'ts. There certainly are do's and don'ts in Christianity. But Christianity could be best summarized as done. Done. Jesus' finished work on the cross is the only performance that we need. Now from that, for salvation, now from that, we should desire out of hearts full of gratitude for him saving us from our sins we ought to desire prayer and giving and all those other spiritual disciplines but those are not the things that save us it is jesus and jesus alone by his grace through faith in the lord jesus christ that we're saved so there's the encouraging word to you this morning god's love for you does not depend upon your performance for him but here's the challenging word. What is your next step to grow in godliness through the spiritual discipline of prayer? We've talked about it a little bit last Sunday to a greater degree this Sunday. Maybe it's taking Matthew chapter 6 and just using that as a guide, a pattern for your prayer life. Maybe it's, it's coming together with other brothers and sisters this Wednesday night at 6 p.m. We're, we're going to spend some time in prayer. We invite you to come. We have a prayer ministry that gathers every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. in the fireside room to pray. You know, what's your next step? What's your next step in praying to our Father 
in heaven and doing so in a way that you desire to grow in him. Would you stand with me? Our musicians are going to come. We just want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. The first question goes back to the beginning of the sermon. And that is, remember we talked about addressing him. He is our Father in heaven. Has there ever been a time in your life where you have gone from being an enemy of the Lord to a child of His? That only happens through Jesus Christ and His work upon the cross. Trusting Him for your salvation. So, are you a child of the King this morning? I'm not asking you if you've prayed or done good works or been baptized here or the lake or anywhere else. I'm asking you, has there ever been a time in your life where you completely gave your heart, soul, and life to Jesus and you just trusted Him? You, you trusted Him to do what you cannot do. You could never save yourself from your sin. Only Jesus' death upon the cross the second question this morning is for those of you who are believers. Are you growing in this spiritual discipline of prayer? Are you hot or cold? Are you growing in that spiritual discipline? What's your next steps in growing in this spiritual discipline of prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity. It's so simple yet so profound. So powerful. Lord, we, we recognize that a vibrant prayer life is powerful and, and, and changes our life and those around us. God, would you just continue to raise up men and women who are prayer warriors at Campbellsville Baptist Church? But Lord, would you remind, remind us that I think sometimes we think, you know, a prayer is for the prayer warriors when you have called all of us to pray without ceasing, not just the prayer warriors. So Lord, may we look and listen this morning to you as you share with us the next, what's the next step in growing in this spiritual discipline of prayer. Lord, we, we just want to pray for every man and woman, boy and girl here in this place. Lord, that they would recognize, if they've never recognized before, that before a person comes to Jesus, they are at an enmity with God. Because of our sin, we are separated from holy God. And only through Jesus and his death on the cross can we be reconciled back to a holy, to the holy heavenly Father. And so, Lord, may we turn from our sin and may we trust Jesus for salvation. I pray, God, for any person in this room who has never done that. May today be the day that they trust Jesus alone to save them from their sins. Lord, this invitation totally belongs to you. Have your will and your way in every heart and every life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to invite you this morning. We've we got some people that would love to come up and just pray with you if you need somebody to pray with you. As we sing praises to the Lord, as we respond to him this morning, you step out in faith and you give praise to Jesus today.